In today's khutbah, I'd like to share with you some brief lessons from really at the end of the day, one single ayah that belongs to Surah Al-Hashr. This is the 59th surah of the Qur'an. It's not a long surah, so it, inshallah after the khutbah, when you get time this weekend, you can go and read through the entire surah yourself. The larger context of this surah is actually some incidents in the life of the Prophet wasallam. I'll give you a brief account because that is not the subject today, but at least some background is important. When Medina was almost completely surrounded by forces that were gathered by their enemies, the Meccans, the Quraysh, who were tired of Islam, and they said, we, we've had the battle of Badr, we've had the battle of Uhud, but we need to finish this problem once and for all. So they tried to agree, get all the different tribes that weren't even at war with the Muslims to agree that, look, if this Islam spreads in the region, you're all going to have trouble later. So might as well get together and end this problem now. Let's go into Medina all at once, all together, a united force, and destroy the Muslims, kill every man, you know, woman and child, it doesn't matter, and we'll just have this problem solved. And that wasn't enough to convince all these different tribes, so they gave them added incentive. And the added incentive was, well, if we kill this entire city, all the spoils, all the property, all the homes, all the money, we'll just distribute it among ourselves. This is going to be a big money-making venture. Right, so the, the, on the outside it made it look like we're doing this for, you can call it national security, but on the inside it was just economic interests. That's all it was. Uh, which is not new, it's, it's not old, it still happens today. It's the same reasons why people go to war today. They make it look like it's for national interest or for the security or the better of a nation, but on the inside is nothing more than economic interests. So anyway, they're able to gather all of these tribes and they go to, you know, they're coming as a conglomerate to attra attack the city of Medina and last minute, one of the companions who's not even from the Arab lands, is Salman al-Farisi radiallahu ta'ala anhu, gives the suggestion that, you know, when we're facing a bigger force in, back in Persia, our military strategy is to actually dig a trench so they can't come through. And even if they do come through, they come through little at a time. They can't use all of their forces and come in. You know, and because if they're much larger, we have to squeeze or dwindle their forces somehow. So this uh, suggestion was taken. And there were so few people ready to, you know, the military is very small. Even the size of the Muslim population was very small. So Rasul ﷺ literally had drafted the entire population. Everybody's digging the trench. Because the armies are already advancing. You don't have time. And so they dig this trench across the front, you know, border of the city of Medina. And this is actually the only reason that the Quraysh and the, all the Ahzab, all the groups that were coming to get us, that's the only reason that held them back and they were stuck on the other side. This is in detail talked about in the 33rd surah, Surah Al-Ahzab. Allah will give His own commentary on what happened in this battle. But in any case, there was another, an additional problem. The additional problem was the Muslims who lived in Medina, they had treaties or peace treaties and cooperation treaties with the Jewish communities that already lived inside Medina. So we had contracts with them that if Medina is attacked, we are going to defend the city of Medina together. This is your home and our home. We coexist in this home. So as a matter of our city's safety, if an enemy comes, we are going to defend the city together. That was agreed upon. Everybody shook hands on it. This was something that was understood. But when this attack happened, the Quraysh were actually able to convince certain tribes of the Jews to actually open up a back door so they can attack from the other side and they even made the agreement that if the attack does come, we'll help you out on the inside. Well, so the Muslims now have to worry not just about the enemy that's on the outside, but they also have to deal with a problem that's starting on the inside. On top of that, within the Muslim community, there were those who the Qur'an declares al-munafiqun, the hypocrites, who on the face were Muslims, but on the inside hated the Prophet wasallam, hated the Muslims, and wanted this thing to be over. So you've got lots of layers of problems. Now, the background of this, this surah, Surah Al-Hashr, the ayah that I wanted to share with you, I wanted to give you all of this background because what happens is, Allah in, in His own miraculous way defends the believers, and the Quraysh return, and the, the scheming of the Jewish tribes that backtracked and violated their own treaty, it failed, and they retreated. They went into their forts outside of Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ basically commanded that since they violated the treaty, and they committed espionage, we're going to go after them. And so the Muslims go after them, and one after the other, their forts start falling. And they, it's not much of a fight, really. It's, it, literally, the Muslims just trample over them, destroying one fort after the other. 
Now when that happens, more wealth comes to Muslims than has ever come before. You know, after Badr, there's some shields and swords on the ground, some horses are left behind and we capture those and those are distributed. But once Khaybar was taken over, and once these Jewish you know, forts were taken over, there was more wealth, more produce, more land than Muslims had ever seen before. So all of a sudden we went from, uh, you know, uh, our, our GDP you can say, went from thousands to the millions, maybe even the hundreds of millions, overnight. And when this much wealth comes in, people start asking questions, where should it go? How should it be distributed? You know? And so revelation came in this surah, telling the Messenger وسلم, how it should be distributed. So Allah Azza wa Jal says, مَا أَفَاءَ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ رَسُولِهِ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْقُرَىٰ فَلِلَّهِ Whatever the Messenger acquired that is to be distributed from those people of the towns, the towns that were taken over, it, is to be it belongs to Allah. Done. So if anybody starts thinking, wow, that's a lot of land. I wonder when the distribution is going to happen. I wonder when we get our tax returns. You know, when they start thinking, first answer so sets you straight, it belongs to Allah. And then by extension, walil rasul, and it belongs to the Messenger. But what about the brave soldiers who fought, who went up into battle, etc.? The next line, the next item is walidil qurba, wal yatama, wal masakin, wa sabil. And it's for close relatives, meaning charity should be given to those in need within your own family, and it should be given to the orphans. And it should be given to those who can't help themselves, the masakin, those who are stuck in a difficult financial situation or a health situation. And then on top of that, those who are traveling, Allah just says basically the purpose of this money is charity. The purpose of this money is charity, it's not to make anybody wealthy. It's going to get distributed. And then He says, Kayla yakuna dulatan bayna laghniya minkum. Allah says, I did this, He did this, so that you don't get a little bit of wealth, you know, or, or most of the wealth hoarded by some wealthy people among you. Like just a handful of people will get all the wealth. Allah wants the wealth to be distributed. You know this idea, it seems like a very basic idea, but if you apply it to the world's economy today, you'll get a different picture. A handful of corporations go from being millionaire corporations to hundreds of billionaire corporations because of wars. At the expense of huge tax-paying populations, Across the world, this is the scene, this is the scenario. And so, this is the, this is the, the, the distribution of wealth, but then Allah, what He did, is He described three groups of people. And this is really what the khutbah is about, the third group of people. But I want you to walk through all three. He then went in a separate ayah, after this ayah, to talk particularly about recipients that should be among the soldiers, among the Muslim army, who should be the number one recipient of this, this wealth? It should be lil fuqara al muhajirin. Those that are completely bankrupt. Fakr in Arabic is for the back to break. Those who are so broken financially, it's like their back is broken. They're buried. And those that have and then the next word describes why is their back broken? Why are they bankrupt? Because they migrated. Because they believed in the Prophet ﷺ, they decided, despite having a home, despite having businesses, despite having jobs, despite having family, they left all of it behind because the Prophet was dearer to them, that was more beloved to them than everything that they owned, the entire life that they knew. They walked away from all of it. Literally not knowing when the next meal is going to come from, where it's going to come from, where they're going to put their head down to sleep. They willingly became homeless out of, out of loyalty to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. These are called the Muhajirun, the migrants, the people who joined him from Mecca. So Allah says, لِلْفُقَرَاءِ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ And then he goes on, SubhanAllah, الَّذِينَ أُخْرِجُوا مِن دِيَارِهِمْ وَأَمْوَالِهِمْ Those who were taken out of their homes, those who were taken away from all of their wealth, مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ يَبْتَغُونَ فَضْلًا مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانًا The only thing they were running after, everybody else runs after a house. Everybody runs after money. These people were only running after something else. They're running away from the house and away from the money. What are they running towards? A favor from Allah. They want Allah to look at them with a special favor. Fadla min Allah. Literally, fadl, if you wanted to take an, a, a modern English translation of the word fadl, it would literally be a bonus. A bonus from Allah. And the fact that Allah will be happy with them. That was enough for them. Fadla min Allahi wa ridwana. And then he says, وَيَنصُرُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ and these people continue to aid Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So now Allah is saying that the most helpful people are bankrupt. <laughs> and they're homeless. 
to Allah, the most appreciated are sometimes the people that have no resources. They have nothing. They, they are so appreciated by Allah, that Allah will dedicate a separate ayah just to them. Just to highlight what they have done for Allah. Especially in a state of war, you would think you should look towards those that have the biggest budget, who can afford to buy the biggest weapons, <coughs> those that have the most military experience, etc, etc. Allah puts all of that aside and says, who's made the most sacrifices for me? These are number one to me. The muhajirun are number one to me. As-sabiqoon, as-sabiqoon, ula'ika al-muqarrabu. The first and the foremost. Those are the ones that have been brought close to Allah. Now, Allah describes them, ula'ika humu sadiqoon Those in fact are truthful people, truest of believers. These are the muhajirun of Makkah. Fine. When this ayah comes down, the ansar start feeling a little bad. Wow, they got a whole ayah to themselves. Allah went out of His way to describe how amazing they are and they are truthful. Does that mean we're not truthful? Does that mean our faith isn't good enough? Yes, we came along afterwards and we supported. We didn't make nearly as many sacrifices as the muhajirun did. But what about us? And so the next ayah acknowledges the ansar. وَالَّذِينَ تَبَوَّأُوا الدَّارِ وَالْإِيمَانِ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ Those that had settled, the, per the perfect place to settle as a home, and they had settled their faith inside of their hearts from much before. Meaning Allah is talking about the Ansar, and He's saying something so beautiful about them, even though they became Muslims later. Allah says the seed of Iman was always there. These people, as soon as they heard about Islam, they were ready to accept. Imagine, the Prophet ﷺ is preaching in Mecca for more than a decade, two-thirds of the Qur'an to the same group of people, many of them who are families with the Prophet ﷺ, and they don't listen. They just don't listen. And yet at the same time, you have a group of people, delegates coming from Medina for Hajj. They have no interest in being preached to. They just listen to the Messenger of Allah ﷺ one time. 12 go back, 70 come back. 70 go back, the entire city becomes Muslim. These people had the seed ready to go. Allah is describing through the, through the seed of the Prophet ﷺ, two different kinds of people. There are people around us that have the seed of Iman in them even if they're not Muslim. Even if they're not Muslim. And Allah acknowledges that. There are those around us that are, that are gonna be like the people of Mecca. No matter what you say, nothing's gonna change. But then there are those who you know, they're not the enemy. They just don't know any better yet. They just don't know any better. And I would argue that people around us, in our neighborhoods, in this country, most of them, they just don't know any better. They just don't. And we have to give the benefit of the doubt. But if they knew, the seed of Iman is already there. The goodness that Allah created every human being with is already there. So Allah acknowledges that about them, not only since after coming to Islam, from even before Islam. And then he says, وَيُؤْثِرُونَ يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِمْ What is the great quality of these Medinan people? They love those who migrated towards them. Listen to this carefully. They love those who migrated towards them. You know, in virtually every country that has an economic problem, they say the first problem is the immigrants. First problem is the immigrants. These people are taking our jobs. These people are a security threat. We don't even know if they're a good, you know, good thing for our nation. We should put them in special neighborhoods. We should have registrations for them. Uh, they're making their way into our neighborhoods and our schools. They're, they're you know, contaminating our language. They're doing all this kind of stuff. And yet Allah describes these have taken a bunch of homeless people. They, they're literally what they are and they have love for them. يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَا يَجِدُونَ فِي صُدُورِهِمْ حَاجَةً مِمَّا أُوتُوا And they don't find ever any constriction in their chest because of what they've been given, the responsibility to take care of these muhajirun. They never find it a problem. There's never a bulge on their forehead. وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ And they give them preference even over themselves. There's time to eat, and they make sure that the, the muhajir that's living in the house with them is eaten first. وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ And then Allah adds, وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصَ Khasasa is actually far more than ju'a. Ah, ju'a ah means hunger. Khasasa, khassa, is actually for hunger that is so bad that you might die. Starvation. They say, they, Allah says, they will give the other food before themselves even when they're starving. Even when they're starving. This is the quality of the Ansar. So you notice in the first ayah, Allah talked about how amazing the muhajirun are. 
In the next ayah, Allah talked about how incredible the Ansar are. And by the way, you should all know, even though Medina is not a millionaire city, they're still doing economically a lot better than the people that came homeless. And when you're doing better than people, you start thinking that you're better than them. When you're doing better, you have more money, and somebody needs your money, you, something inside you says, this person is less than I am. I need to help them. And you get a sense of superiority, even if you're charitable. Even if you give charity, that idea that somehow you are superior to the one you are helping. The one who came and asked you for help is somehow inferior to you. That thought can be there even if you never said it. Allah says, وَمَن يُوقَ شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ That's how he ends this ayah. Whoever can guard themselves from that self-righteous and, and that self-indulgence, self-importance that they have deep inside themselves, those are the ultimately successful. So now the second group of people is also successful because they don't even have that inside themselves. They're helping the Ansar, they're, they're helping the Muhajirun, but they don't think of themselves as better. When you and I help someone, don't think of yourselves as better. As a matter of fact, the ones being helped were mentioned by Allah first. And Allah gave them a higher rank. Then He mentioned second, those who were ready to help. But then the question arises, what about the rest of us? I mean, this khutbah is about how amazing the muhajirun are, how amazing the ansar are, the people of Mecca who accepted Islam, the people of Medina who accepted Islam, and everything they did. But what about the rest of this ummah? What about you and me? Where is the inspiration for us? Yes, we can try and be in that category to be something like those who were al-fuqara al-muhajirin, but we're not being asked to leave our homes. We're not asked to be homeless. We don't necessarily have a situation where we have refugees coming and staying inside, inside of our homes. And if there are refugees, we should be the first to, to welcome them into our homes, by the way. You know? But then there's the third group. And Allah in His mercy in this surah mentioned the third group. And that third group is, the language of that ayah is so beautiful, it includes every single one of us until the Day of Judgment. وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِن بَعْدِهِمْ And those who came much after them. So these two groups and those who came much after them. That includes all of us. Now you notice, I want to compare here, in the first group, they sacrificed by migrating. They left everything behind. The second group showed love and support despite being hungry themselves. They did amazing things. They made huge sacrifices. Both groups made huge sacrifices. What sacrifice is the third group going to make? Let's see. He says, يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا This third group is amazing because the first thing they do is they say, Oh Allah, forgive us. They ask Allah's forgiveness. وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا And forgive our brothers. الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَ بِالْإِيمَانِ Who came before us with faith. And those who are ahead of us in their iman. You know what this means? The first loving, the, the quality that Allah loves about these people. The Muslims that will come after, that Allah makes them so important that He'll talk about them in His Qur'an, is He's gonna say, these are people who first of all want Allah to forgive them. But when they ask Allah to forgive them, they also ask Allah to forgive their brothers. And they also assume about their brothers that their brothers have more faith than they do. الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَ بِالْإِيمَانِ Not just الَّذِينَ مَضَوْ إِيمَانًا You know, those who came in the past and they were believers. But also those who are around us that have more iman than we do. Ya Allah, all the other Muslims are better than I am. Ya Allah, forgive them too. They don't think of themselves as better. They think of others as, they assume others are better. They just work with that assumption. الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَ بِالْإِيمَانِ وَلَا تَجْعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا غِلًّا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا And don't put in our hearts. Now there's an Arabic word, I won't translate it at first. Don't put inside of our hearts, and don't allow the placement inside of our hearts of غِل for those who believe, for any who have believed. Now what in the world is غِل? The word غَلَّ in Arabic, شِدَّةُ الْعَطْشِ وَالْحَرَارَةِ They say in the Arabic language, the word غِل is extreme thirst and heat. And from it, the figurative meaning comes of al-hasad, al-ghish, al you know, al-haqad, al-nafar. They say in the Arabic language that this word actually means cheating. Ya Allah, don't make us those who feel like it's okay to cheat other Muslims. Ya Allah, don't make us of those who feel like it's okay to hate another Muslim. 
to look at another Muslim with jealousy, to look down at another Muslim, to have intense aggravation towards another believer. Ya Allah, don't make my heart dirty with that. Allah mentions this third group of people and their amazing accomplishment is that they don't hate each other. That's their amazing accomplishment. They can think of the other as better than themselves and they don't develop, they don't let their heart be filled with hate towards another Muslim. They don't think, you know, what happens, what shaitan does, is when you have a dispute with somebody, he'll first tell you that that person is a bad Muslim. That he is violating the Qur'an or the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. That this person is a hypocrite and they're corrupt and they're evil, etc. Now that they're evil, backbiting against them, talking bad about them, criticizing them, even cheating them in business is okay because they're the devil to begin with. I'm, do, I'm fighting somebody evil. First you demonize a person, and you make them look like the devil, and then you can do whatever you want thereafter. Allah is, we're, we are begging Allah in this ayah, don't make us of the kind of people who develop these sentiments and let them fester inside of us to the point where we are, it's, it becomes okay for us to do horrible things to fellow believers. To feel those things. لا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا by the way, ghil in the Arabic language is something that is done, not something that necessarily is felt. وَمَا كَانَ لِنَبِيٍّ أَنْ يَغُلَّ وَمَنْ يَغْلُلْ يَأْتِي بِمَا غَلَّ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ in Surah Al-Imran. Ghil is also used for cheating or wanting more for yourselves. But ghil has yet another meaning that I want to share with you. Ghil, some say, شِدَّةُ adawa and شِدَّةُ hub. They say it's extreme animosity. Like you hear somebody's name and it just your meter just spikes. Fumes start coming, start coming out of your ears. You become unreasonably aggressive towards somebody, that's ghil. But there's another ghil. And the other ghil is when you become unreasonably defensive of another Muslim. Unreasonably, you know, good towards another Muslim. Now what does that mean? It means when you decide that you are following someone, you look up to someone and you turn them into an angel. They can't do anything wrong. They can't be a human being. You don't want to hear anything about them. You don't want to see any flaw in them. We are, the Prophet ﷺ would tell us, Al-Muslim Mir'atul Muslim. The Muslim is the mirror of another Muslim. You know what that means? You and I, our relationship is like a mirror. When you stand in the mirror, if I'm wearing dirty clothes, I'm going to see a spot. And if I see something good, I'm going to see it. If I see something bad, I'll see it. If I see something good, if something good is there, I'll see it. It's not like my clothes are ironed and I'm going to see them wrinkled. And it's not like if my hair is combed, I'm going to see it uncombed. I'm going to see exactly what I am. Believers to each other are not delusional. They're not delusional that they only see bad in someone. And they're also not delusional that they only see good in someone. But they don't assume. See the previous ayah, how this comes together? You don't assume that someone's bad on the inside. But if you see something wrong, if you see something wrong is being done, something wrong is being said, then it's part of your love for your brother that you go and tell them, this is wrong. I am your mirror. This is wrong. It shouldn't be like this. But you don't do it out of hate. You don't do it out of a sense of superiority. And you're just as easy, to, just as, easy as it is for most of us, if not all of us, to criticize. To point out what somebody else is doing wrong. It's not easy to hear it. It's not easy. When somebody else comes and tells you, the way you did this, what you said, how you prayed, the way you parked your car outside, that was wrong. The way you, you know, the way you conducted yourself, what you wrote in that email, that was wrong. We don't want to hear that. We're not very good at taking criticism, we're extremely good at giving criticism. If we're truly going to become a mirror, then we're going to have to learn that this is a two-way street. That's part of لا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا And so this, this incredible ayah then ends, ربنا إنك رؤوف الرحيم our master, you are the one that is incredibly compassionate. Ra'fa in Arabic is to actually understand what the other is going through. Allah, when we call Allah Ra'uf, it actually means Allah knows all of my emotions. He knows all of my frustrations. He knows what wrong somebody did to me. He knows what situations I went through. He understands it. You know sometimes you try to tell someone you're going through a hard time, but you notice that they don't really, they're not really sensitive. They don't really see it. Oh, what's the big deal? They might just say, oh, what's the big deal? Get over it. How are you saying it over? Do you even realize what I went through? Yeah, it doesn't sound like much of a problem. It's hard to, for someone 
just because you went through an experience to get them to feel what you felt. It's hard. But Allah Azza wa describes Himself as Ra'uf. He knows what you feel. He knows what you felt. He knows the pain you went through, the stress you went through, the fear you went through, the anxiety you went through. He, he knows all of it. And that name of Allah, these Asma Allah, that come at the end of, you know, the Fawasil, the ends of Ayat, they are there for a purpose. When we call Allah Ra'uf, we are actually asking Allah to empower us with that name. In other words, make us more, give us more Ra'fa, give us more compassion towards each other. Ya Allah, you are Rahim to us, make us Rahim to each other. Make us loving and caring towards each other. That's when we call it Allah's names. We're actually hoping that Allah blesses us with those names. Not just that He gives us compassion, but He empowers us with compa- compassion towards others. He makes us sensitive towards others. So the, I, as I conclude, just the thing I'd like you to remember. Allah in this incredible, incredible sequence of ayat has mentioned the muhajirun. Then He's mentioned the ansar. Amazing people! And then third, he's mentioned you and me if we can learn to be good to each other. <laughs> That's the summary here. We can be in a high rank with Allah, mentioned in His Qur'an, if we can just learn to fix the way we deal with each other. If we can just not keep things in our heart towards our fellow believer. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us of those who He has spoken so highly of in His book. May Allah Azza wa Jal reward those who came before us with Iman and not make us of those who have any ill feeling and hate and animosity and extreme extreme attitudes towards the fellow believer may Allah truly make us of those who can be mirrors to one another barakallahu li wa lakum fil qur'an al-hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyyakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-hakim